to share a particular story I had um, about a patient who was in the operating room recently. And it's a story I think you guys would all appreciate because it just showed how much power you can have even in the most stressful moments uh, of your life here in the operating room. So this particular patient actually didn't speak any English at all. And uh, it's always tough when you have a patient that doesn't speak English who's having surgery because you know they don't really understand what's going on. Think about it, you're coming into the operating room and you're in a room like this here with all these you know, bright lights, video cameras, big screens, and if you don't know what's going on and there isn't anyone there who can explain to you what's going on, couldn't that be incredibly you know, scary and stressful? Absolutely. Hey, Heidi, good to see you. RJ World, good to see you. Soph, good to see you. <laughs> um, good seeing you all here. I was just, you know, let me, let me just backtrack there. Um, uh, oh, Irish Peg 33, I see you. Alex, hey, well, Irish Peg, I'm sorry about the avascular necrosis. Um, that's certainly not an easy one. Uh, I wonder if you've seen a chronic pain specialist yet? Um, unfortunately, unless the bone pain is under control, anything else is going to be a band aid when you have avascular necrosis. So, um, my heart does go out to you. I hope everyone else here who's watching now or later also sends you positive vibes. But I wanted to share a story about a patient that I had recently who came into the operating room for a pretty minor surgery, but they didn't speak any English. And uh, it just goes to show how much power you can have when you're in the moment connecting with someone. So in the case of Irish Peggy there, I wonder if your doctors have actually sat down, uh, put an arm on your shoulder, looked you in the eye and actually talked about your pain. If you're comfortable sharing that, I'd like to know what you've, uh, what you've experienced because that level of human connection is really rare in medicine. In this particular case, when I couldn't even communicate with them because they don't understand English, what options do I have left? You know, put yourself in my shoes. What do you do when someone's coming here in the most you know, stressful moment of their life? They have an oxygen mask that goes on their face and you know, it's kind of claustrophobic. They don't know what's going on. How do you connect with someone and how do you help somebody appreciate that they're not as helpless as they may feel? How do you help them appreciate that they're cared for, guided, and that they're the most important person to you in the whole operating room team for the next couple of hours during their surgery? I'll tell you what I did, but I want to know what you guys think first. And I also want to keep up with your questions. So Heidi, you've been asking for so long, um, snoring under anesthesia. What do we do when you snore under anesthesia? So we'll take a quick brief from <laughs> a quick break from my story there. We will come back to it. But when you snore under anesthesia, it's actually quite dangerous because you can snore so badly that you can actually not only not breathe, but you can actually generate so much negative pressure in your chest that you can drown your lungs. It's called negative pressure pulmonary edema. It is very dangerous. Fortunately, it's quite rare. It happens more often in young, healthy people who can generate giant intrathoracic forces that are negative enough to drown your lungs. What do we do to prevent that? Well, firstly, we have these tools here called oral airways. These things we put in your mouth like this, and that helps prevent you from snoring because it moves all your tissue out of the way. And if you want to know why I'm talking about drowning your lungs, what that has to do is because Imagine inhaling against a straw, like you have a really bad asthma attack, a really bad asthma attack, and you're trying to breathe in through this straw, but someone's clamped to the straw. You're generating a giant pressure inside your chest to breathe in, but the, that straw is clamped, so you can't actually get any air in, so your lungs are getting big, but no air is going inside to fill your lungs. The absence of air in your lungs creates a kind of a vacuum-like effect that will suck water in to your lungs and will drown them. Um, it can happen if you bite down on the breathing tube, like literally you have a straw in your mouth, yeah, bite down and that will cause negative pressure pulmonary edema. Severe snoring in obese patients, especially those with sleep apnea, can also cause it, it's rare, but uh, lethal when it happens. Did that answer your question, Heidi? Okay, uh, trigeminal neuralgia. Oh my gosh, I'm so, I'm so sorry, So, Gosh, I'm sorry about that. Do you see a chronic pain specialist just helping you through that? Because that's not easy to treat, certainly. Um, oh, great. Great. Snap girl, snaps girl 189. 
Good to see you, Tammy. Um, you had surgery on March 14th. I hope your recovery is going well. A wonderful nurse calmed me by touching me until I got knocked out. So snap girl, that is exactly what I did with this patient and I've done it many times actually in cesarean sections. Why do I do this in cesarean sections? Who here knows why I do it in cesarean sections? The power of touch is so underrated in medicine because we like to resort, you know, it's easy to just push an IV medication like this one here. I don't know if you guys can see that there in the camera. It's kind of blurry, I think, but it's called midazolam. It's easy to push medications like propofol. It's easy to get someone just to knock out. It's much harder in that, in that moment to connect with somebody, especially because you have the pressure of time. You need to get the operating room moving. You have to get the surgery going. You don't want to delay the next patient, right? But what are the ways that you can, in the most efficient time possible, Establish a strong connection. Well, you know what I do? I call my patients the night before surgery so we can have a relaxed conversation to help prepare them for the next day. But the power of touch is one of the big things you can do. So with my patient earlier that I was telling you about who didn't speak English, that was actually my, um, that was my go-to. And I use it in patients who are having cesarean sections because I can't give them these medications, right? It's hard to give these things safely because they're going to affect the baby's brain, they're going to affect mom's brain, and they can increase the danger of the cesarean section. So that's where the power of touch comes in because we literally don't have that many other tools to be able to get that level of calmness because we know that calm patients do better in surgery. No question about that. All right. I had a hysterectomy. She was the best. I stopped freaking out. Tammy, I love your story. Thank you so much for sharing. Irish Peg. My pain management docs are kind enough to let me know they will prescribe meds as long as the law allows them. Okay, well, Irish Peg, I'm happy that you found pain docs that you can work with who understand that the whole opioid epidemic here, like, I mean, this stuff here, can you guys see this? Yeah, these things have dangers, right? And a lot of patients think that I'm against these medications. They think, oh, Dr. Cobb, I just wants to do nerve blocks and, you know, sprinkle valerian root over me. They don't, they don't want to give me fentanyl and oxycodone and all that. But that's like so not true. I don't know, I don't know if you guys can see that, but this was a vial of fentanyl. So I use it in the operating room all the time. And I use it after surgery all the time because pain needs to be addressed. So I have nothing against opioids when used safely. Like Irish Peg is saying she's got widespread avascular necrosis. Knowing nothing else about your case, Irish Peg, well, the pain needs to be controlled because pain can increase the risk of depression, of anxiety, of tremendous mental health burden that can then affect your heart, increase your risk potentially of early onset dementia. I mean, the list goes on, right? Pain has to be addressed. And in some cases like yours, perhaps opioids are the best treatment for you. In many other cases, they are not. And that's why I talk about nerve blocks, talk about mind-body. I connect myself to the monitors like this, teach you guys how you can increase your parasympathetic tone. Because we believe the higher your parasympathetic tone, the the higher your pain threshold is, the less likely you are to feel pain from things that might cause pain in other people. All right. Um, uh, Kenny G has been going into AFib the past few nights. Um, what can you do to, to stay in normal sinus rhythm? Well, Kenny, it depends on what's causing the atrial fibrillation. It's a little unsettling just to have atrial fibrillation and not know what caused it. So certainly whatever, um, you can look up the Pirates Mnemonic. All medical students in the United States learn the Pirates Mnemonic. You can look it up on Google for what can cause or trigger atrial fibrillation. Things like hyperthyroidism, pregnancy, infections, uh, sepsis, et cetera, et cetera. But the point is that it depends on what caused it in the first place. I can't give you an answer without knowing more about you. And I hope that many of you guys appreciate that when you want to look for a holistic medicine doctor, or an integrated medicine doctor, never go, never. This is the one of the few times I'll say a blanket statement. Do not go for a doctor who just wants to push things without learning more about who you are. Things like, why do I have atrial fibrillation? Why do I have chronic pain? All these things, you know, these are what I ask. Because how can I give a recommendation to somebody without knowing more about them? The most common one I get, the most common one I get, what supplements and what vitamins should I take? And it's like, well, depends on who you are. Unless someone wants to sell you vitamins or sell you supplements, <laughs> what are they doing recommending things to you? Depends on what your diet is, 
what your needs are. You know, if you're a pregnant woman, for example, you're breastfeeding or you're an adult male or if you're over 65, all these things go into our determination for what you should be supplementing with, if anything at all. So someone who's just blanket statements saying, oh, do this, do that. Do they have a financial interest? Those are the doctors, if they even are doctors, that I would be very skeptical of. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Um, very good. Very good. Guys, maybe a couple more minutes here. I, I just love your questions. I love your stories. I love your stories. Um, I do want to just pull out my medications here for a hot minute as well. Um, talk about this one here. I hope. Who here has ever felt this one in their body? And I want to get it to actually focus. Can you guys read what it says on here, especially under in the small print there? It says for cardiac arrhythmias. Lidocaine. Is, is that, has anyone ever experienced this medication? And did you know that you can not only inject this in your skin to numb you, you can inject it in the IV? Did anyone know that? Yeah. Heidi knows what, what I'm talking about. So this medication can not only go into your epidural, into your spinal anesthetic, or into your skin to numb your skin, around your teeth to numb your teeth, you can actually inject it in your IV. And did you know that it's used for certain cardiac arrhythmias? Hence what it said here on the bottle. Did you, did you know that? Can you guys read that there? It's powerful stuff and it comes from a plant, which just underscores how much, how much power there is in the natural world around us that's inspired so many of our medications. That's why I love plant medicine. I love looking at the natural sources of so many of our treatments. Um, it's similar to the stuff they put in Bengay. I don't remember what's in Bengay, um, but the, there are like 5% uh, lidocaine patches and that is what they use in there. Yeah, there's topical lidocaine, but I also injected IV actually, um, very, very frequently in the operating room because it can actually turn off, it can help pain in other parts of your body as well. Did you know that? That IV lidocaine can actually help pain all over your body? Pretty cool stuff. It can also affect the heart because the sodium channels that cause it to block pain can also block conduction in your heart. And that's why it affects your heart. Also can affect the sodium channels in your brain where it can cause seizures and other bad things. But we use it at doses low enough to prevent it from giving you seizures and arrhythmias. <laughs> all right, uh, so that one's got a natural source by the way. And maybe we'll end with one more. Um, ah, how about this one? Who knows what this one is? Uh, not showing up here. That's not helpful. Okay. Who knows what this one is? Where does this one come from? Also very powerful. In fact, this one is so powerful, it is on par with the pain relieving effects of this one. Did you know that? Interestingly, they both come from plants in their original source. Now they are both synthetic, but they're both inspired from a plant source. Did you guys know this? Okay, I don't see any comments. Who, oh, okay. So we all know that this one does, right? This one comes from the poppy. Pika Kirby, there we go. Is that a little bit bigger? Oh, maybe they were too small to read. Is that more clear? This one comes from the poppy. So this one, so, gee, this one comes from the poppy plant, as you know. And this one comes from, this one comes, the Ketorolank is a form of NSAID. The original NSAID was aspirin. Aspirin comes from willow bark. So they both come from plant sources originally. And did you know that ketorolac, which is this synthetic NSAID, is on par with the strength of morphine, which is why I like to give it in patients after surgery if we want to minimize the use of opioids because opioids can be powerful when they're needed. Remember guys, I'm not anti-opioid, right? But if we have alternatives, we want to have a holistic health plan. We don't want to just slam oxycodone up until you're constipated for the next two weeks. That doesn't do anyone any good. It increases the risk of addiction and other complications. So 
Ketorolac is actually as effective as like low to moderate dose morphine in the emergency room and the operating room. We use it pretty frequently. It's pretty incredible. And they both come from plants. This one being a synthetic non-steroidal, uh, which was originally seen in willow bark. Yep, Bayer made that aspirin like over a hundred years ago. Anyway, so that was just a little bit of our plant medicine there. I hope you guys appreciate that. Um, Wow, we covered a lot of ground today. If, uh, I just want everyone to remember that if you're learning something, hit that like button and share with others. I do have a great video I'm working on right now. I can't wait to publish it. Um, I did the last one on marijuana and it's some possible benefits, some huge impacts it has in the operating room. But the next one I think is gonna be even more interesting on what the original natural anesthetics were. And I don't know if you guys knew, but there were many, for thousands and thousands of years, ancient people have been trying to make anesthesia so that patients could have surgery. Didn't work so well. I'll give you a quick little teaser, but the three things that people experimented with, you know, actually I'll let you guys tell me. Do you guys know what the three things they experimented with were? What were the things that people experimented with to achieve anesthesia in ancient times from like semi-natural things? Hey, thank you all so much for your kind comments, but I want you guys to I wanna see if anyone can guess any of the three things that we use in ancient times. I have a video comparing them to our modern anesthetics and I'm so excited because it just shows how powerful the natural world can be. But can anyone guess? Who can guess what, what are these things I'm gonna talk about in the video? I'm so excited. I already said one of them, all right? It starts with an M. It was marijuana. All right, I'll, I'll cut to the chase. Marijuana for thousands of years has been known, right? I'll talk about what works and what doesn't work. <laughs> but what are the other two that humans have tried for thousands of years to achieve anesthesia with? Oh, oh. I'm really excited to see if anyone can guess it. I'll give you a massive shout out if you can guess. There's a little bit of a lag with the comments on YouTube Live, I've learned. And TikTok Live is much faster for the comments. All right, well, if no one's gonna guess, I will tell, like Heidi said. The original anesthetic agents were marijuana, cannabis indica, alcohol, because that was discovered like 8,000 years ago, and then poppy, right? Poppy, we said, fentanyl, right? All the opioids come from the unripe poppy seed. Turns out that, well, we'll go into all the specifics. If human beings for thousands of years tried to mix these together, they didn't work very well. Like Heidi said, poppy seeds, that's absolutely right. Um, it's the unripe poppy seeds, by the way, that have to be extracted to get natural opium from. But uh, yeah, we still use some of them today in the operating room because things like propofol actually still have the same action as alcohol does. Obviously, opioids have the same action as opium does. Marijuana, however, is different. We don't use any of the marijuana uh, type Medicaid or any medications inspired from marijuana in the operating room. There's a couple we use in modern medicine, but um, I did a whole video on that so you can check that one out. But yeah, GER, I'm not saying anyone should use any of these three. These are all very harmful and I talk about why they can be so dangerous, but they were the original attempts at trying to um, have anesthesia in ancient times. So they're super interesting about what worked, what didn't work in them. And I'm very excited to share that video because it shows how uh, powerful plants can be, but also how dangerous they can be in the balance, especially in a time before you have safety equipment like monitors and other things like you see today in a modern operating room. So that video will be coming out in a couple of days. I can't wait to share it with you guys. I hope everyone has a good rest of the day. Remember that you have more power over your health than you've ever been told. Take care. <laughs> Peace.